is good. It's good to be saved. Amen. Amen. All right, Leviticus. I want to preach to you tonight on the laws of the land. The laws of the land. Leviticus in the 26th chapter. It's where we will begin tonight. Leviticus chapter 26. We'll read a few verses together. Leviticus 26. If you're there, say amen. amen. Let's begin Uh, we'll just start in verse number 1 to lay a little bit of context down, okay? Verse 1, Ye shall make no idols, nor graven image, neither rear you up any standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. So he's taken them to a land, and there are some things, some laws, that he wants them to understand. For that land. All right, verse 2. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain and due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. And you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land. Say the next word safely, and I will give, say the next word, peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you, say the next word, afraid. And I will rid, say the next two words, evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the, say it, sword go through your land, and ye shall chase your, say it, enemies, and they shall fall before you by the, say it, sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your, say it, enemies shall fall before you by the, say it, sword. All right, laws of the land. Let's pray together for a few minutes. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you help us. God, I pray that you uh, will open up this passage of Scripture, speak into their heart as you've spoken into mine. I pray now, God, as I am preaching, I pray that as you translated those words of the apostles in in Acts 2 into those hearers' ears and into their hearts, I pray that you translate mine. And God, I pray that uh, you will uh, give us each, everyone, eyes to see and ears to hear, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I pray you make this sermon more than it is. I pray you make me more than I am. And God, make this message exactly what our people need tonight. Uh, Lord, it is such a... Uh, Such a diverse group, uh, such a diverse flock. We've got people that have been saved for many, many decades. We have men that have been teaching and preaching and studying the Bible for decades. Uh, We have uh, ladies that have been around church and in church and serving you with their life for, for many years. God, we have some that are just getting started. We have some that are just that are just new to this thing. They're just getting in. We've got some that are kind of in the middle. And God, I pray that you make this sermon exactly what everybody needs. No matter how far along on our journey we are, no matter how long we've been in this thing or how fresh it is to us, I pray that you help all of us tonight. I pray that you give us what we stand in need of. And do that now, which only you can. I pray that you'll speak into our hearts for what we need. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 You can be seated. Leviticus is all about the laws for the land. They are uh, on a journey headed to the promised land. That's why they left Egypt, uh, to the land flowing with milk and honey. And uh, that is God's ultimate will for them, is to get them into the land that he has promised to give them, the land that he promised to Abraham uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. That land, he wants to get them there. And that's what Leviticus is all about. Exodus is all about getting uh, Israel out of Egypt, and Leviticus is all about getting the Egypt out of Israel. It took them all of one night to get them across the Red Sea and to officially get Israel out of Egypt. But it'll take 40 years of going through the wilderness and 40 years of learning these new laws and 40 years of trial and error, 40 years of bad mistakes. God would later say, you've tempted me these ten times. Ten times they crossed the line on God, getting that Egypt out of them. If you'll hold your place there and look in Leviticus chapter 18, I believe I showed you this verse last week. But the book of Leviticus is all about cleaning them up. And Leviticus chapter 18 kind of gives us the main uh, 
jugular of Leviticus. Look at verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, ye shall not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. So the life that you used to be around, don't do that anymore. The place where you're going, all right, you find them doing these new things, serving these new gods, having these new deals. Don't do that either. You do what I say. You live by my laws. Verse number 4, he said, Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. And so all throughout Leviticus, there are sacrifices and, uh, and to sanctify them. Exodus is their salvation by blood. Leviticus is their sanctification by blood. And we'll say that again. Exodus is their salvation by blood. Leviticus is their sanctification by blood. Now, I know a lot of people that know a lot about salvation but not much about sanctification. I know a lot of, I know a lot of us, get, we're, real, we're real heavy on gospel, get saved, but we're real light on epistles, get right. That, that exodus, that exodus at all, man, that happened just that fast. It was a, I mean, when they crossed the Red Sea, they were out. Son, it was over, it was done. And when you get saved, it is over and done. You are God's, you belong to Him. You are made a new creature. You have a new father. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You are born again. That sanctification, well, that's a whole different story. And so God has uh, given us many, many Bible verses, and He's given us uh, just record after record after record of actual events that truly happened. All right, just like you remember yesterday happening, the accounts that we read in the Pentateuch happened. I need more than one amen on that one. The account that we read in the book of Leviticus, the book of Numbers, the book of Exodus, the book of Genesis, all of those things were real days just like yesterday was in your mind, that these things really happened. Brother Brandon, go ahead and put that first Bible verse up there. I want you to see some of these verses from the New Testament. Listen, let me say this before we even look at the verse. What we believe about the Bible is what the Bible says about the Bible. All right, what I believe about this book that I'm holding is what this book told me about itself. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, written before the New Testament, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. I know Leviticus is about the nation of Israel, but these things that were written down were written for our learning, that we through patience and in and, and, and the Scriptures might have hope. Put that next one up there, Brother Brandon. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9 through 11. Listen to this. See if you can figure out who it's talking about. It's pretty clear, but just see if you can figure it out. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. That sounds familiar. Neither murmur ye. Well, that sounds real familiar. Oh, yeah. if, you, if you were here with us the last couple of Sundays, you, you, that's familiar. As some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Uh, this is crystal clear. That's Israel in the book of uh, uh, Leviticus, the book of Exodus, the book of uh, Numbers. That, this is crystal clear. All right. Now, all these things happened unto them for our ensamples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So a completely different age for you hyper-dispensationalists. This is for, this, those things were written down in the book of Leviticus, Exodus, Genesis, Numbers. All those things were written down for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. So these things that happened in the Pentateuch, these God detailed, I mean ridiculously detailed the, uh, the travelings and the accounts and the failures and blunders of Israel in these 40 years for our admonition, for a different age. Does that make sense? Am I losing you there? I, I said the word hyper-dispensationalist. That is somebody that, that believes that the dispensation of the Old Testament and then the dispensation of the New Testament and that, that the Old Testament scriptures aren't even, don't even apply to us. Okay, well, uh, that's fine if you want to say that, but it contradicts what God's Word said about itself. And so what I believe about God's Word is what God's Word said about God's Word. Amen. 
And so these things that we're looking at, these laws that we are going to see, I want you to understand they're directly to Israel, about Israel, in the literal, physical, promised land. But they're for our admonition, they're for our learning. Why? So that we might have hope in the Scriptures. And so that we might have patience, and so that we might be able to understand how things are going in our day-to-day life. All right? Does that make sense? Are you with me? Say amen. Okay. And so the laws of the land. In Leviticus chapter 26, he is, he is bringing Israel, he is bringing Israel out of Egypt and his ultimate plan for them is to get them into the promised land. Now we know that the, the final, complete, absolute, final, complete for Israel is eternity. The new Jerusalem, the new Israel. Do you all understand what I'm saying? But God's ultimate will for the nation of Israel on earth was the promised land. That was God's will. It's what he promised Abraham. It's what he brought Moses up for. That's what he destroyed Egypt and Pharaoh for, to get them to the promised land, because that's his will. He wants them there because that's his will for their life. If if you are a son of Jacob, it is God's will that you live in the promised land. Does that make sense? That's where he wants you to be. With God's people serving Him. That's, that, that's His will in the promised land. Is, does that make sense? I know it's Wednesday and yes, some of you look kind of tired, but I'm going to make sure we, we understand that getting Israel into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, that was God's will for their life. How many of you strive to be in God's will for your life and know that there we oftentimes make that the will of God this big, real blanket, kind of general, vague thing that you couldn't find with a microscope in the FBI. But how many of you understand that God's will is pretty clear? A lot of times it's clear. He, what He wants us to do, where He wants us to be. It's specific. Okay? And so God's will for them was this land. He wants them to be in this land. But with, those, with this land comes some laws, okay, comes some laws. And I want to look at, I want to just look at three laws tonight, three, uh, three laws of uh, the nature of this land, three, na- three laws of how things work. Uh, we often will use the term laws of nature. If you jump off a building, you will hit the ground because of the laws of nature. That's how it works here. If you jump on something on the moon, you might float for a while because it's a different land. But the laws of nature that govern this land is if you jump off a building, you will hit the ground. Okay? That's a law of nature. That's, that, that governs this. Okay? If you go underwater and do not come back up, you will die from a lack of oxygen. All right? That's the laws of nature. That's the laws of our land. There are some things that govern us. And it dictates what we jump off of. It dictates how long we go underwater or if we go underwater at all for some of you with a phobia about that. These laws govern how we live. Does that make sense? And he is about to give three laws. Maybe not so much as a specific of bring this sacrifice for this particular offering or this particular sin on this particular day. There are laws like that. Those are called the ceremonial law. Raise your hand if you understand what I just said. All right. But this, these three laws that we are going to see, they govern, they govern how things operate in the land. They govern, let me say it this way, how things operate in the will of God. They govern how things operate in the will of God. All right, I want to show them to you, and, I, and, I, and I'm without any doubt in my heart, these make a direct application to our life as New Testament Christians. All right, let's look in verse number 5. How many of you are still with me? Say amen. amen. Verse number 5, I want to begin at that colon down there about halfway through. And ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely, and I will give peace in the land. And ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid, and I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. Ye shall chase your enemies, enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I want you to notice the first law is a law of a coexistence. A coexistence. 
when the nation of Israel would finally get through the wilderness, away from Egypt, into the land that God has sworn to them. When they finally get to God's will, there is going to be a coexistence there. You say, of what? Well, let's look at these verses again. I had you say these words, I'm going to have you do it again. Verse 5, Ye shall eat your bread of the full and dwell in your land, how? Safely. And I will give you what? Peace in the land. So there's going to be safety and there's going to be peace. Well, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Safety and peace. That sounds divine. That sounds splendid. Let's sign up. Let's go on this trip. Let's go there where there's safety where there's peace. I don't want to have to fight anymore. I don't want to have to uh, uh, carry a sword to protect myself. I don't want to have to have enemies anymore. I want peace and I want safety. All right, well, that's great. That's going to be in the will of God. But notice what else exists inside the will of God. He said, none shall make you afraid. I will rid evil beasts out of your land. So there's going to be evil beasts there. There's going to be things that could make you afraid there. Verse number 7, you shall chase your enemies. So there's going to be enemies there. And they're going to fall by your sword. So there's going to be war there. So there's a coexistence in the will of God of peace and a whole lot of problems. There's the coexistence inside the will of God, inside God's perfect will for that nation. There's going to be a coexistence of peace and a whole bunch of bad stuff. There's going to be evil beasts. God forewarned them in the book of Exodus that there's some evil beasts in the field, Exodus chapter 23. There's evil beasts there. He said, I'm not even going to get you in there too soon lest the, the beasts multiply against you. And, uh, and so there's beasts there. There's enemies there that are only going to be overcome by a sword. All right, so that's not, just the, that's not the sword of the tongue. That's the sword of the one in your hand that you swing and chop somebody's head off sword. All right, this is a soldier's sword. This is, these are war terms. These are fighting terms. And so in the will of God is a coexistence of peace and evil, of peace and fighting, of, of peace and war. You're going to get to the perfect place that God has been taking care of. God was taking care of that land, making sure it rained on it enough. And God promised that, and I believe it's in the book of Numbers, but God had been taking care of that land just for them. And when they get there, there's going to be peace. There's going to be fighting. And that is a, a law of the will of God that Israel would live through was that there's not only good, but there's also some bad things that we are going to face. And it sounds an awful lot to me like what Jesus said in John chapter 16 and verse number 33 where he told them that in this world ye shall have tribulation. You shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Look what he says first before he even says that. These things have I spoken to you that ye, say the next word, might have peace. That you might have peace. So just because Jesus says it doesn't mean you have peace. You probably read that Bible verse once a year. You have probably read that Bible verse many times throughout your life. That doesn't mean you have peace. Jesus said, I've spoken these things that you might have peace. It's not contingent upon him. He gave us the word, but our peace is not contingent upon is he going to come through for us. Okay? These things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. Uh, in the, there's a typo there. Y'all at Cora know she done that. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Tribulation. You're going to have tribulation. Jesus promised us that. You're going to have the coexistence of peace from the Word of God. You've got peace that passes all understanding. That is going to be there, but you're also going to have tribulation. You're also going to have tribulation. Look in Acts chapter 14 and verse number 22, Brother Brandon. You got that one? All right, look. Paul said we went about confirming. Man, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Why? That we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 14, he said that we must, maybe it's not a typo on this screen. Let's look over here. Oh, it is. Much tribulation. We're going to have much tribulation. Then again in Romans chapter 8, Brother Brandon, Romans chapter 8, verse number 35. He said, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He goes on to say that uh, neither height nor depth nor uh, principalities nor powers nor anything shall separate us from the love of Christ. Brethren, I want to let you know that the laws of the realm that you and I live in is that there is a coexistence of the peace of God and all the evils of this world. They coexist. They live in the same realm. There is peace and problems. There are bad things that are going to come against us. There are enemies. There are wars that we are going to fight. There are troubles. There are valleys we have to walk through. There are bad things that you, even as God's child, in God's will, are going to have to experience. Look into Romans 12, verse 12. He said, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Now you and I don't really rejoice in hope. We rejoice after God fixes it, then we rejoice. In hope, where woe is me. In hope, we're filled with doubt, like Thomas. Thomas was not rejoicing in the hope of that resurrection. He doubted it. He rejoiced after God proved it. All right, we, we, throw, we throw a little bit of shade on Thomas, but how many of us rejoice in hope before God fixes it, before God proves it, before God makes it undeniably clear that He has delivered us through that trial? How many of us rejoice just in the hope? Just in the hope. You see, there's a law that governs where we are at, and it is a law of a coexistence. There is a coexistence of peace and problems. There are enemies that are going to be fought by a sword. There are fights that you and I are going to fight. There are battles that you and I are going to wake up and find ourselves in. Does that make any sense? You see, when they got the land flung with milk and honey, they were going to have to fight for it. They were going to have to pull out a sword and a shield and a bow, get in a chariot and fight for it. And a lot of times I think we have got a major disconnect between what we perceive or what we think in our minds of what the will of God is and what it actually is. We, because Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And since he said that, then, well, everything must be easy. Everything must be light. Nothing must be heavy. Well, what about Paul and all of these tribulation, tribulation, tribulation? We were pressed out of measure, even so much that we despaired even of life. What about all these verses? You see, there's a coexistence, brethren, of peace and trouble and enemies and warfare. That's what Israel was going into. The will of God was filled with warfare, fighting. Now, I don't like to fight. Do you like to fight? No, Brother Stephen loves to fight. That's just, that's just, he keeps boxing gloves in the back seat of his truck. He's ready to go at all times. We don't like to fight. But to have peace in the will of God takes a fight. So there's a coexistence in the will of God of peace and trouble. You see, uh, uh, before I move on, I just want to just reiterate this. I want to make it clear that when Israel finally got across the Jordan, what was the first thing they had to do? Jericho. The very first thing they had to do. All right? The very first thing they had to do was fight a giant foe. It would have been very easy to walk into that and say, oh, we made a wrong turn. This isn't it. We, we can't go there. That's not the will of God. There's evil people over there, giant people over there. We're like grasshoppers to them. Their beasts are huge. Everything's huge. We're not huge. This isn't right. You see, I'm saying that because that's what they did in the book of Numbers. That's exactly what they did in Numbers chapter 13. They got there and said, mm, uh -uh. this ain't right. Joshua and Caleb said, oh, oh, yeah, we can. We can do it. We'd be much able. God is for us. We can do it. The rest of them said, mm, mm And I walked around the desert for 40 years. And a lot of times, at the first sign of trouble, we think, oh, this isn't right. This isn't right. We've made a mistake. We've made a wrong turn. This isn't familiar. This isn't familiar. Me and my wife, when we travel, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be driving, and, and we'll be then driving back, and I'll say, we didn't even come this way. I didn't see that. She'll say, yes, we did. No, we did not pass that. I swear we didn't pass that building right there. 
and then we'll get to the stop sign. It's like, oh yeah, we did pass that. So, <laughs> we're like, this isn't familiar. We made a wrong turn. This isn't right. We're in the wrong place. Something must be wrong. And at the first sign of trouble, that is our knee-jerk reaction to say, something's not right. Something's wrong. We're in the wrong place. But brethren, there is a coexistence of peace and problems in the will of God. Like in the best will of God. All right. God, he, he was said in Isaiah, he said, what more could I have done for them, for Israel? He said, I planted my vineyard. He said, I took care of them. I, I gave them what they needed. I, what more could I have done? That was the perfect will of God. It was the best will for them. The perfect place. And it was filled with trouble. It was filled with it. Filled with evil. With beasts. Filled with war and bloodshed and fighting and sleepless nights and so there's a coexistence quickly. Number two, there's not just a coexistence there, but I want you to notice in verse number seven, there's a chasing there. There's a chasing there. Verse seven, and ye shall say the next word. Chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall say it. Chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. He said, you are going to chase your enemies away. You're going to chase them down. All right, you know what it means to chase? All right, this is the LRW definition of chase. It means to aggressively follow after with the intention of overcoming. When you're chasing something down, you are aggressively chasing it with the intention of overcoming it. That's what it means to chase something. When you are chasing somebody, your intention is to follow them so aggressively that you get to where they're at before they get gone from where they're at. It's intentional. It is, let me say it this way, proactive. It's proactive. Now, that may not sound like a big deal to you, but it would seem like a big deal if you've been in slavery for the last 400 years and you haven't made a decision for yourself since you were born. You eat when they say eat. You eat what they say to eat. You carry what they say carry. And you don't put that down until they give you permission to. And if you go against what they say, they're going to beat the daylights out of you. You see, the whips of the Egyptian had beaten more than their backs. It had broken their will. And they were enslaved in a slave mentality. They were still in a bondage mentality. That's why when the uh, nation of Israel got to the Jordan the first time and got and sent those 12 spies over and they saw the giants and they saw the big stuff and the scary animals, they said, uh-uh, we can't do that. We ain't, we, ain't, mm -mm, we ain't nothing. And Joshua and Caleb said, if God wants us to do it, we can do it. If God, we be much able. No, we're not able. We only do what they let us do. We can only do what, what, we're, what we're allowed to do. I mean, we can't do that. Bondage mentality. He said, when you get there, you are going to be proactive. And you are going to have victory over your foes, but it's going to be a proactive victory. It's going to be intentional. You're not going to just sit there and twiddle your thumbs, quoting verses from the Pentateuch, and then watch your enemies just fall over dead. You're going to get up, you're going to get your sword, and you're going to chase them down. And can I say that for us living in the New Testament church age, that we don't ever get victory over sin just by sitting on a church pew? You don't get victory over sin because you come and sit here three times a week and listen to me talk. You don't get victory over a bad temper just by, just by coming and sitting still for a minute. You don't get victory over lusting just because it just went away. Your overcoming is not organic. And my generation is obsessed with everything just being organic. Everything just has to be natural and just happen. What about that Bible word called duty? Or it's your duty. Like it is your obligation to obey the will of God on purpose. Or I order my steps in thy word. Like tell me where to go. Tell me what God's word lets us know what our action plan is. And he said, when you get to the where you're going, when you get to God's will, you are going to chase your enemies down. You're going to chase them out. And can I say that if you and I are going to have victory over sin, over our fleshly habits, over our own nature, it's going to be because we chased it down. It's going to be a proactive, intentional victory. It's, we're not going to wake up and be better. You're not going to wake up and stop cussing. 
You're not going to wake up and get victory over, over that sin that's plagued you. You're not going to just wake up and one day be like, oh man, you're not going to hear me preach a particular sermon and go home and never struggle with that particular thing again. It is going to be a pro You're going to chase it down. You are going to take initiative. And in the will of God, that's a law. That is a law that governs how far we go. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, he said, and pressing forward the mark of Christ. I press towards it. I press. I'm, I'm pushing. I'm chasing it. I'm after it. I'm, I'm, I'm not as one that just beateth the air. I'm not just wasting my breath. I'm after something. Are you after anything? As a child of God, did you stop chasing it after you got saved? Or are you still chasing something? Are you chasing your victory? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you, there's some victory that you still don't have? There's some spiritual Christian victory that you don't have yet. Every honest person in the room would have to say, that's me. Still got some victories to win. Still got some battles to fight. I still got some giants that ain't dead yet. Look, take David and Goliath, the most familiar story in the entire Bible, just about. David got there, and there's, there's an army that's got that Goliath surrounded. All right, he's in a valley. They're on top of the mountain. They've got him surrounded. But they're just standing there. You've got a king whose head and shoulders every man. Saul's a big dude. And Saul was a man's man. So, I mean, Saul done some, some pretty awesome things. Jonathan, the son of Saul, who did more awesome things than Saul, he's there too. And for 40 days, they just stand there. Don't do anything. And they never got the giant down. They weren't messing with him. They didn't believe what he said. But they were in his shadow and they were under him. He was winning. They were just standing there. David showed up and David ran down that valley in the name of Christ and overcome. He chased it. He was after it. Are you after anything? Are you after victory? Or are you waiting on it to happen? Are you waiting on something to fall out of the sky and knock that giant down? Are you waiting on a special star to fall and just hit the spiritual lottery? All right, there's a law of chasing. All right, but notice this last thing. This is really where I wanted to get to, verse number 8. There will be a conquering. He said, And five of you shall chase a hundred. And a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. He said, five of you are going to beat a hundred. All right, that five men versus a hundred, that's twenty apiece. All right? I, I could handle my own against anyone in the room, probably, and not die. You might get me to say uncle, but I won't die. I can handle my own. But if I had to fight 20 of you, not happening. The fittest man in the room, and we can discuss that later, couldn't handle all 20 of us. In the book of Numbers, they saw those giants and said, Mm-mm, I can't do that. We ain't fighting them. They're bigger than us. I put my hands on them. A whole lot bigger than me. But in the will of God, he said, five of you are going to beat 100. You're going to be able to handle 20. You are going to be able to go to war and fight 20. And 100 of you are going to be able to fight 10,000 and put 10,000 to flight. All right? I don't, I'm not a very great math person, but I think that's like a, a 100 a person, 100 to 1. Can you imagine fighting 100 people and winning I mean, how would you like to have that story? Tell at work on Monday. You know, how was your weekend? I beat up 100 guys at one time. I mean, come on. He said, in the will of God, here it is, in the will of God, you are going to be, handle, you're going to be able to handle a whole lot more than what you normally could. 
you are going to be able to have victory over a whole lot more than what you normally could. Almost like a supernatural thing. It, it, it'll almost be like you are, have some type of supernatural powers that the other ones don't have. It'll almost be like there's something godlike living inside of you that is giving you this strength to overcome 20 men. I don't know if that's clicking with any of you or not, but when I read that, I can't help but think about, have I ever overcome 20 things? Are there 20 sins that I've got to get over? Are there 20 problems? Are there 20 foes, spiritual warfare? Are there 20 Christian fights that I have been able to win through the power of Christ? In the will of God, you can handle more. All right, let me ask you this personal question. Have you ever felt like you had too much on you at one time? Have you ever felt like you were way in over your head? Have you ever felt like the, the pressure and the spiritual fight was way more than you ever thought and you're not going to make it? Ever been there? In the will of God, Brother Stephen quoted it Sunday night, we are more than conquerors. All right, he talked about being more than a winner. That's a conqueror. What's more than a conqueror? We're more than conquerors. If I, if, I, if I conquer Derek, I'm a conqueror. But if I conquer all of you, I'm a conqueror of conquerors. We've won another step. I'm a conqueror of conquerors. That's more than a conqueror. In the will of God, we can handle more. In the will of God, we can have more victory than out of the will of God. All right? Let me, let me wrap this up and I'll be done. Israel got into, into the promised land when Moses died and they walked in in the book of Joshua. And they had a fight after a fight after a fight after a fight and they conquered and they conquered and they conquered and they conquered and they didn't. Other than a little episode of Ai, which they bounced back and then won, they didn't have a defeat all throughout the book of Joshua. They were in God's will and right with God. And they were victory after victory after victory. They were on a roll. Ever been on a roll? Ever, spiritually, it's okay to say amen. Ever had uh, Brother Aaron Bibb talks about having a spiritual growth spurt? Ever had one of those? Israel had a spiritual growth spurt. They went through a series of victories all throughout the book of Joshua. But then Joshua died. And all his generation died. In the book of Judges, they start to backslide. And in the exact same land that God had given them victory in, over and over and over again, they start losing in over and over and over and over again. In the will of God, but not right with God. In the will of God, but not right with God. And when before, they can handle more. In the will of God, you can handle more. When you're right with God, in God's will, you can handle it. Have you, have you ever maybe been in a situation and it was your world was ending, it was so huge and it was destroying you and you were like, this is like end of, end of world ending stuff. And then you go to sit down with somebody and say, this is what's going on. And they're like... We'll just do this, and they'll fix it. And you're like, no, this is, you're supposed to be dying. I'm dying. You're supposed to be dying with me. This is coming, the world's stopping. And they're like, no, it's not. No, it's not. And they teach you how to handle it. Has that ever happened to anyone else but other than me? Other than me? Anybody? Thank you, one honest person. Thank you. Sometimes things get so giant so fast. The book of Judges opens up with a defeat because the opponents had iron chariots. Funny thing about that is God in the book of Joshua told them, you can beat them even though they have iron chariots. You can handle that. With me, through my strength, in my name, through my power, 
you can handle that. The coexistence of peace and problems, like you can handle those problems through the peace of God. He said that none shall make you afraid. You shall lie down and none shall make you afraid. Ever had trouble sleeping because of stress, because of anxiety, because of worry, because of fear? In the will of God, right with God, you can handle a whole lot more. When we're, when we're right with God, in God's will, we can overcome and be more than conquerors. Miss Leslie, if you can come on the piano. We can conquer and we can have victory. All right, so five are going to beat 100, and that's 1 to 20. And then 100 are going to beat 10,000. All right, that's, that's 1 to 100. All right, let me ask you a question. How's your victory? How's your victory in God's will? I believe most of you would probably say, I am in God's will at this moment, I'm where I'm supposed to be. I am sitting where I'm supposed to be. I don't just mean on the pew on Wednesday night. That is God's will, by the way. Forsaken not the assembling yourselves together as manner such you all understand what Hebrews says. Like, it is God's will you be in church when the doors are open. That is the will of God for you. But above that, you're in the will of God. You, you would probably say amen to that in your heart. All right, how is your victory in the will of God? All right, because the story for Israel d- didn't end so well. They had a great run until Joshua died. And then everything fell apart after that. By the time Samuel comes along, they're begging for a king. They don't even want a preacher's leadership anymore. They just want a king like everybody else. Before long after that, now they're just destroyed by Babylon. They're in bondage for 70 years, and they weren't a nation again until 80 years ago. All right, how's your victory? In the will of God, you can have it. I'm not trying to sound like T.D. Jakes, but in the will of God, you can have victory. Like that thing that's been in your way, I mean, get it in your mind right now, that sin that has been in your way. Like, in the will of God, through the power of God, in the name of God, you can overcome that. You can chase it down and beat it through God, right with God, in the will of God. And that's laws of the land. That's what governs it. That's what governs the peace. That's what governs the joy That's what governs the relationship with God. There is a coexistence. There are problems. In the will of God, there are trouble, there are wars, there are fightings. In the will of God, it's a coexistence. There's a chasing. There is a proactivity. And there's a conquering. You can handle more. I want to be able to handle more. when, When my plate gets full, I don't want God to take it off. I just want my plate to get bigger. I, I want to be able to, to do it. All right? Not for my glory. I don't want my strength to do it. But I want Christ and I want His power to prevail in my life so that I can do it. I said Sunday morning about the, the, the children of Israel when they got to Exodus uh, 17 and they were at a mountain with no water. and They needed God to break open, a, break open that mountain. Give them that river. Like, I, I want God to do that in me. I, I want God to give me that strength. I want God to give me victory. Not for my glory. But that chapter, you can read it when you get home. It goes on to say, he said, if you do these things, he said, I'll have respect unto you. How about that? He said, and I will hear you. and You'll be mine. I'll be your God. And I'll walk with you. In the will of God, you can handle more.